Case in the Cover is a bi-monthly podcast where friends and library co-workers, Mary and Jen, review books, study the publishing industry, and try to unlock the secrets behind every cover. Can you judge a book by its cover? Join Mary and Jen on the case to find out. Hello and welcome to another episode of Case in the Cover, the podcast where, frankly, I don't know why some books get published. I am Mary and with me as always from a distance is my co-host Jen. Hi, Jen. How are you today? I am good. Did the new equipment pick up my happy hi? No, I think I'm trying oh. to think it's Zoom that that mutes you because <laughs> Jen has fancy new equipment. She's got a new mic. She sounds so nice, but it still cut off your hi. So I think that's oh. Zoom noise noise canceling you. It's Zoom that hates me then. Yeah. Not my not my equipment. I we'll might be see... attacked by cats here. Because okay. you you record a backup on Audacity. You'll have to go through and play your backup and see if it catches you when you do the high note. Oh yes, I totally record a backup on Audacity. She 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 should be recording a backup. That's okay. I I I'm totally recording a backup on Audacity. Are, are you now? <laughs> I will be. I mean, it's just, yeah, I'm... You're the one that needs the backup. You're the one with a robot in your house. I I don't have a robot in my house. I mean, I might have a robot in my house. All right. I I am now definitely recording a backup. Well, good. Now that, now that you're recording, we can, we can talk about, about things. Um, so, you know, I, Jen still has a backlog, like a very long one. As it's long, not that long. As much as we try. And I think the reason you still have a backlog is because you can read like four or five good books in the time it has taken me to torture myself through one very, very bad book. And so I would <laughs> like to preface everything I'm about to say. You've seen the title of the book in our in our title in the description. I'm sorry if you are the author of this book listening to this podcast. I'm going to trash the book. Uh, forewarned. Forewarned. I have not seen the title of the book yet. No, I know. I have been reading this book for like three months. No, maybe not that long. Maybe two months. I wouldn't let Jen see the title of it because the title is ridiculous and yet still not the most ridiculous thing about this book. So. <laughs> you did read to me a couple of passages in the book. I got to the point where I was screenshotting passages in the book because I found them so ridiculous. Oh, goodness. Um, yes. And I have too many on my phone. I have like probably 20 on my phone of just bad passages that I just felt the need to screenshot. Um, so, yeah, so I've spent like three months reading this book and I keep telling Jen how bad it is, but I wouldn't tell her the name of the book uh, because I wanted to save that. We have talked about books that we haven't yet covered on the show kinds of books we've done you know half a dozen romance books at this point we've done some ya we've done some historical fiction but uh, and we did like a patterson kind of thriller shooty uppy kind of a book but we haven't done like a you know mass market paperback mystery novel (gasps) cozy mysteries yeah cozy mysteries sure let's call them that so that is what I went and did is I found one of these because we hadn't done one yet. And oh my God, Jen. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen with you so you can see how how bad, how bad R is. What the heck is going on? This book is called Murder Can Confuse Your Chihuahua, a haunted craft fair mystery. It's by Rose Pressy. And apparently Janet Ivanovich said, Rose Pressy's books are fun. That is such a non-compliment. That is super non-committal. Wow. (laughs) Also, this looks like a children's book. So the cover of this book, it's very cartoony um, illustration. It's a dog sitting on a table, pressing on some paint. There's a painting, but it's facing away from you. So you can't see what's on the painting. You see a um, kind of a grassy, parky looking background. The Chihuahua's wearing a hat for whatever reason. Um, I'm really wearing the hat. The hat is around the neck of this poor Chihuahua. It's behind him, yes. And there's a pink trailer and truck in the background, which is important. Um, 
there are some elements of this cover that work, but also I have some complaints of this cover. Um, so this is, I will preface also what I'm about to criticize. This is the second book in the series. I picked it up because it I saw it on the shelf and it looks stupid. And so I picked it up. Um, there are two other books. The first book in the series is called, I have it here, Murder Can Mess Up Your Masterpiece. Hey, it's like a skull clown face thing going on. Yeah, so that's important. Um, this is the same dog. He's still got a hat on him yet again, but he's also not wearing it. It's like propped up against him. And he's got some beads in his mouth, the pink trailers in the background. They're at another craft fair. And this time you see the painting and it's a flower painting, but there's like a skull hidden in it. That's the first book in the series. And the newest book is called Murder Can Haunt Your Handiwork, a haunted craft fair mystery. The dog has a paintbrush in his mouth, the pink trailers in the background, they're in a park, but also there's a manor and there's a ghostly looking portrait and there's like ghost trees in the background. Yeah, it's very interesting. I'm so confused by these I, murder can confuse the gen <laughs> <laughs> yeah, i know it's so dumb so okay first of all i'm gonna start with the cover there's a lot to say about this book too there's so much to say about this book but we're gonna start with the cover and with the title especially in comparison to the other two covers um so you'll notice with the murder can mess up your masterpiece and murder can haunt your handiwork first of all those two titles suggest crafts right yes because these are these are craft fair mystery books they are mysteries that take place at i'm assuming craft fairs the main character is a painter um no yeah could you guess that <laughs> <laughs> um, but what kind of painter because it kind of looks like she makes knockoff versions of of other people's art because she doesn't have like her own style on there. It's like one is a portrait of an old dude and the other is a floral painting. And we don't know what that third one is. I mean, not necessarily. So the thing about the character in these books is she paints from what I could tell in the one I read, mostly landscapes, but also she, okay, well, I'm gonna hold off on telling you the secret. Not yet, Jen, we're not there yet. Um, but landscapes, theoretically, is what she's painting, at least in the book that I read. I don't know what she paints in the other two. Okay. Um, but you will see that the first one, the one of the book I read, you see the Chihuahua, you see the pink um, the pink trailer. Those are both very important because she she's uh, living this bohemian lifestyle, driving all over to craft fairs with her, with her Chihuahua and her pink little um, camper. So those are both important. Um, so I will. Give so she's my mom. <laughs> Is she? <laughs> I hope not. I'm just thinking of my mom with her little dogs and her big RV. That's all. God, I hope this isn't your mom. Um, and <laughs> so the murder can mess up your masterpiece, and the murder can haunt your handiwork. Both are the crafty thing. And okay, now I will tell you the secret, Jen. One of the many. She has some sort of magic painting power. Where when she paints things, there's hidden messages in them that theoretically help her solve mysteries. But also there's no evidence of that in the book I read. But that's what she tells me. as the, That's what the character tells the, the reader. So my number one problem with the murder can confuse your chihuahua is that the chihuahua has nothing to do with it being a craft fair. Number two is that unlike the other two, where you see the skull in the flowers and you see the creepy man and the, the trees in the background, there's nothing on this cover that matches that. You don't see the painting. There's nothing in the background that looks like a ghost or like a spook or like a skeleton or anything. And I feel like that's missing from this cover. Is there skulls or something going on maybe with that little jar of paintbrushes? No, that doesn't, I don't think so. Is the bow... No, it's just a pink bow on the jar of brushes. The and doilies aren't skulls? No, they're just okay. doilies. And I'm just checking. I, I've looked at this cover like a lot because I'm like, where's the scary thing? Where is it? It's not on this cover. So the little I have a magic painting power doesn't really make sense in this in, in this one. Um, it just doesn't make any sense. Uh, the Chihuahua looks very concerned about what he is seeing on that painting, though. I, I so guess... maybe it's really bad. Maybe they can't show it. 
Also, the other reason I hate this title is because the Chihuahua has nothing to do with the murder. So I don't know why murder is confusing him. I really don't. (laughs) So I'm now going to read you, Jen, the synopsis of this book so that you get kind of a general idea of what this book is about. And then I'm going to fill in the problems I have with the book itself. So already I hate the title. The cover is lacking. And the other two, I mean, they're not the best cover art I've ever seen, but at least the other two fit both the titles and the covers fit more with what this is supposed to be. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like the, this one shortchanged what my expectation should be. So this is what the book is about. There's a killer in the picture. No, there's not. Celeste Cabot has a flair for painting and a touch of paranormal talent too. She's just arrived to sell her artwork at a big craft fair in North Carolina, complete with rides, games, and deep fried everything. But the sunny landscapes takes her on a darker hue, takes on a darker hue when her chihuahua, Van Gogh, leads her to the riverbank and to a body that was definitely not part of her design. With help from a handsome fellow artist, Celeste sets out to draw the brazen killer onto her canvas. No, she doesn't. She'll need to balance the victim's past, a suspected love triangle, and a long ago accident, and also consult with a medium and a spirit to try to paint the murderous fiend into a corner. What? Tells you nothing. It tells you absolutely nothing. Well, and you said that none of the things that happen in that description happen in the book. Well, yes and no. It's the it's mostly the painting thing. So again, this is the second book. So I don't know how much of the she has a magical painting power was set up in the first book. But in this book, it basically, she's a painter. She goes to her little paint craft fair. She immediately goes to the river to paint and finds a dead body. And then decides she's going to stick her nose in it, even though she really is not a good detective, which is another thing I have an issue with in this book. Um <laughs> And so she immediately goes, she sees this body. And then when she paints her pictures, there's not a, the person that she paints in the picture comes to life as a spirit ghost of like a Native American woman from like 300 years ago, who then bugs her for the rest of the book, but really does nothing to help her solve the mystery. So she doesn't like paint clues to the murder into her paintings. She paints people in her paintings that then are spirits that come to life that are supposed to quote unquote help her solve the mystery, but they really don't. Okay. Maybe the other two books are better, Mary. Maybe. I'm not going to read them. I'm not going to find out. So (laughs) she, she paints these two people. First, she paints this woman. I can't remember her name. She's a native American woman. And then later the native American woman's like, you need to go and paint again. You need to go and paint again. I think it's important. And so she goes back and paints again at the murder site. And then the native American woman's grandfather shows up as a ghost to take her back to the spirit world. And then the two of them spend the rest of the book fighting and doing little to help anybody, except for at the end, which I'm not going to hit yet. So beginning of the book, she goes, she paints, she finds a dead body, and then she goes and paints again. And she gets a ghost friend who doesn't do anything to help her the rest of the book. And then the first thing she does is immediately assumes the scariest man at the fair is the murderer. And she spends the rest of the book harassing the shit out of him for no reason just he's scary so he must be the murderer i'm gonna harass him like he's the murderer and oh my gosh i made notes i'm gonna try to hit on all my points so i hit magic paintings do nothing right i hit that point (laughs) um uh i hit oh why are we at the craft show i'll hit that one she goes to a craft show because she wants to make it as a painter but she literally spends First of all, this craft show is like, I don't know, maybe three weeks long. The entirety of the book, this craft show is going on. And I feel like it's way too long. It's longer than a weekend. Maybe it's a week long. But she spends literally no time there. She will like set up her paintings and then she'll go into town to to try to solve the mystery. And like at one point she leaves her best friend in charge of her stuff. The best friend is only in that chapter to watch her stuff while she leaves. Um, I, 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 I don't know why she's at this fair. She, she, she doesn't really sell anything. She spends all her time either at the, um, murder site painting ghosts or at in town looking for clues 
or visiting the psychic who is useless and gets her nowhere that just keeps telling her to go back to the murder scene over and over again and she goes to her like four times and it doesn't do anything it doesn't help <laughs> anything um so i i so i hit um the bad cover i hit the bad title i'm, I'm trying, trying to hit all my notes because there are so many um bad at clues accuses on whim yeah i got that one um, cause yeah, she immediately assumes that the scariest guy at the fair is the bad guy. And then there's another random woman she's like excusing and screaming at who may have ended up being the accomplice. I frankly don't remember, nor do I care. <laughs> um, at one point, like her paintings get vandalized and she just like charges at this random other woman at the fair and starts screaming at her. But I mean, is this, is she the woman that vandalized her paintings? I don't know. I don't think they ever confirm it. I think that woman ends up being an accomplice to the murderer. I mean, she's also leaving her paintings all unattended at a craft fair. Like, right. what do you expect like to happen? Like, overnight, and this woman vandalizes her paintings. And, and she thinks this woman vandalized her paintings and then goes and screams at her until the boy shows up. And we'll get to the boys. Um, also, I wrote, one of my notes says, ghosts, recipes, magic paintings huh <laughs> because i don't know if you know this about um other you know cozy mysteries but a lot of those like bake shop mysteries and stuff will put like recipes in them oh there are two random chapters in this book where she puts a recipe at the end are there recipes like of things being eaten in those chapters yeah in two chapters she goes to like a diner and then she puts a recipe at the end of that chapter I don't know why. Somebody told her you should put a recipe in here. And so she put a recipe in there. That's what happened. Apparently. I don't know why the recipes are there. This book is trying to be way too many things. It's a mystery novel. It's a ghost novel. It's a bake shop novel. It's a craft fair novel. It's a romance novel. It's it's too many things. Um, I hit why are you even at the craft show? Um, the dog is a person. Will hit dog as a person because she behaves like the dog is a person. I, I read this is one of the, the entries I read to Jen. I'm see if I can find it. At oh, one, yes. <laughs> at one point in the book, she's going to visit her parents. I'm trying to see if I can find this one because it's it's pretty good. Not, by good, I mean awful. This dog is pretty much Scooby Doo. Like, it there's is. so many Scooby Doo reference type things in this book so far. This book is basically Scooby Doo. I swear to God. She thinks that chihuahua. she's writing a Scooby Doo novel. Let me see if I can find it. Oh my gosh. Uh, where is the dog? Where is it? Oh no, that's the <laughs> brothers. We'll get to the brothers too. Oh my God, I screenshotted so many pages. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. You know what gets me though? You say that this book is trying to be so many things. I look at this cover and the overall design of it is very, it's very youthful. It is very cartoony, not in the adult cartoony kind of way. It looks like it's trying to appeal to children. And the font is very childlike as well. And I know it can also be like craft fair like. Yeah. But it does feel like, I mean, for an adult novel, you could have picked something a little more scrolly looking, something that maybe is like, um, like cross stitched instead of like, it looks like it's badly sewn together. Mm -hmm, it does. The, the lettering. So Which like, to me, this feels like it was originally aimed for children. I don't think so like the i wouldn't think that the that the plot isn't but maybe the cover designer misunderstood yes because the plot is not for kids and it's not like it's not explicitly like anything but it's just not appealing to children it's it's an old lady book i'm sorry it's an old lady book also the craft fair thing not a single person at this craft fair in this book does anything but paint so I also get the impression that the woman who writes these books thinks that arts and crafts literally ends up painting because <gasps> everyone in the book, except maybe one guy who's a woodworker or something, just paints. They all have paintings. This must be the most boring craft fair anyone's ever been to when everyone just is painting. Yeah, that's a little odd. Yeah. So I found, okay, so I found the dog thing, right? Um, so she's going to her parents' house. She says to the dog... Let's get out of here, Van. Do you want to see your pappy and mama? 
He covered his eyes with his paws. Yes, I know they're a bit quirky, but we love them. This is how she talks to her dog. And then on the next page, I pulled into the driveway and cut off the engine. Oh, she blows on her way to her parents. She goes to see the psychic. Okay, Van, we're here to see Madame Gerard. You like her, remember? Again, he placed his paws up to his eyes at this as if he didn't want to see. This is also just bad writing. Oh, I'll get to that. We will get there. Jen, this is going to be, I'm telling you, this is just me trashing a book. This is the worst book I've ever read for this pod. Possibly ever read in general. It's so bad. We have to be careful with that because, you know, we, we, we get in trouble, Mary. We get in trouble. That's why I said I was going to trash this book. I'm sorry. So the dog acts like a person sometimes, but not all the time, but she treats it like it's a person. And also she brings it with her everywhere, including when she's trying to get clues. So the murder victim had this old friend who was maybe, or maybe it's an ex's other girlfriend or something that works at a bakery. So at one point, Celeste goes to a bakery and specifically leaves the campsite to go to this bakery to, to bother this woman at her job. And doesn't occur to her until she gets the bakery that she cannot bring the dog to the bakery. And then she conveniently finds her grandmother sitting outside the bakery and just goes, here, Grandma, watch my dog. And that's the only time the grandmother shows up in the entire book. So we have a best friend that shows up conveniently to babysit your craft projects. Yes. And a grandmother that conveniently shows up to babysit your dog. Yep. And a ghost that conveniently shows up to do nothing. (laughs) And um, the other thing is like this, it's like, It's almost like this author tried to build like this character's dynamic group of whatever, but every single character except for maybe Celeste and the boyfriend, which I'll get into, are so one note characters that only show up to serve a very specific purpose. And they're all very like tell don't show. So she goes to see her family for dinner at one point in the book. And then later in the book, Her brothers, she and the boyfriend find her brothers at the side of the road because they've run out of gas. And then they also show up at the end of the fair for the big closing at the fair, right? And the entire book, she keeps going on. Every time she mentions the family, it's, oh, my family's so nuts. And, oh, they embarrass me so much. And they're so crazy. And I can't handle my brothers because they're such shenanigans. But the only thing that the brothers do in the entire book that is any sort of shenanigans is... A, they run out of gas at the side of the road, which, oh, hi, Jinx. And they enter a pie eating contest at the fair, which is also somehow, oh, hi, Jinx. Like, they're not the fucking Weasley twins. (laughs) That is such a quotable right there. (laughs) We need that on a button. (laughs) So if the entire book is, oh, my family's so crazy, but they're not, she just says they are. Um, So the characters serve no purpose. What's with the brothers? Okay, I'm getting down to the end of my of my of my list here. Um, eh, okay, we'll talk about the boyfriends and then no, we'll talk about the killer and then we'll talk about the boyfriends. So the Scooby Doo, I call it a Scooby Doo villain. You called the dog Scooby Doo. It's a Scooby Doo villain. It's the second person you meet. Uh huh. Exactly. <laughs> the second. Not just the second person you meet, but it's kind of somewhere between a Scooby Doo villain and a Psych villain. Have you ever seen an episode of the show Psych? I, I actually have seen the entire series of Psych. So you know how in an episode of Psych, it's not just the second person you meet, but also it's the character that you only meet once? Okay, yes. Yes. That's who the killer is in this book. So not the old man that she's harassing the entire book. He's not the killer. It's the ex-boyfriend that she runs into for five minutes when she harasses him at a cafe, and then he just happens to be the killer at the end of the book. Her ex-boyfriend. No, no, no. The 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 victim's ex-boyfriend. Okay. And she does not find this out by finding clues to find out who the killer is. She spends the entire book talking to the ghost and bugging the psychic. She attempts to find like two clues. She finds some article about a woman, um, about the victim when she got in a car crash. And I think that is sort of involved with the accomplice or whatever. And she finds, she 
goes through the other woman's, the, the friend's phone at the bakery, who it has nothing to do with anything. She like her phone, this woman at work sets her phone on the counter and doesn't notice that a stranger is going through it while she's working. Um, yeah. um, and so those are the only like clues she finds, which neither one of them have anything. To, oh, and she finds a bottle of root beer at the murder site. And then after she finds the bottle, realizes that the scary old guy that she's been accusing the entire time of being a murderer drinks root beer. Ooh, he must be the murderer. Let's harass him some more. Oh my God. He's not the murderer. He's just old man Smithers or whatever. He's not the murderer. <laughs> old man Smithers. And so at the end of the book, the last chapter, when there's literally nowhere else to go, or the second to last chapter, her dog randomly runs after one of the ghosts, the grandpa ghost, who's just flying away after he's fought with his granddaughter ghost for the last four chapters. He just randomly floats off into the forest and the dog randomly chases him. And she then chases the dog and runs into the murderer who then tries to murder her. And that's how she solves the mystery. Uh but Mary, <laughs> I don't understand. Neither did I. This book was so hard to read. Okay, so you know that I pick up like my chunk novels and try to yeah make them pretty again. So the one that I'm currently working on is a mystery, and I'm including some stuff from characters that I wrote when I was in like junior high, mm-hmm. and I feel like this is about the caliber of work <laughs> well so here's and and i, I was gonna say this for last but we'll save the boyfriends for last because that's a thing this book reads to me like you know when you're doing NaNoWriMo and you have a word count and so you're just you're just writing to get the word count because you want to get your word count for the day you want to get like i know my NaNoWriMo from this last year was nothing but filler bullshit i'm aware of that this book is like the NaNoWriMo novel that got put through spell check and then got published. There oh is no editing in this book. Every single chapter feels like she's just trying to get to a word count. There's like a thing that happens in each chapter that basically strong arms the plot to move forward. There's no organic movement. Just a thing has to happen in every chapter. And the rest of the chapter is filler. And then also the chapters usually like don't, they feel like they should end on a cliffhanger, but then they just kind of don't. So like the one where she's going through the phone, right? If you want to build tension in a book, if you're the detective and you're trying to find evidence and you're trying to do it in a sneaky way before you get caught, that's a good place to build tension, right? Right. Instead, the chapter's like, oh, she's busy. I'm going to look at her phone. Oh boy, I sure feel tense. And that, and then that's the end of the chapter. And the next chapter starts with, well, I, she didn't catch me and now I'm leaving. Nothing there. No, like every chapter is like that. Oh no, there's a note under my door, which I never tell you who sent her the notes. Oh no, there's a murderous note under my door. Someone's rattling my door. And then the next chapter is, I went back to bed and hoped that no one rattled my door anymore. Like that's how it's written. I swear, like obviously not word for word, but that's like how it's, I think I took a screenshot of one of those. Because I was just so perplexed by how this was written. I don't know if this was just her churning stuff out because she knows she can sell it, but it's just so poorly written. It just hurt me, Jen. It hurt me so much. See, Um, this is the thing that gets me. The cover on here says, USA Today, best-selling author, Rose Pressy. You've got a quote from Janet Ivanovich, for goodness sakes. What makes these books so freaking special? I want to know the secret. I mean, I can only assume that like she maybe wrote another book that did really well and she's just selling the rest of her books on the she's a best-selling author. Either that or this is there's a type of person that just loves so much to read these it takes me two minutes to put my brain to sleep kind of books that they don't care. Same kind of thing as like the really, really like by the numbers romance novels that all they care about is like just a little wrong. It's like watching an episode of a shitty sitcom. Like, <laughs> is that what this is? Because I don't understand who otherwise this, if this is just fluff for the sake of fluff, fine. There is no substance to this. The characters have no substance. 
The plot has no substance. It's not written well. Everything is like a cardboard cutout doing a mime of a mystery novel. I don't understand why this was written. I really don't, except for a cash grab because she knew someone would publish it. Wow. Tell us how you really feel. She puts little pieces of advice at the beginning of each chapter. Like, stay hydrated. The weather can get to you and make you feel drained. That leads to not being able to stay alert and focused. You don't want to miss a customer or a ghost. So it's like this, I'm also, I'm a ghost hunter and also I'm a detective and also I'm a crafter and also I accuse old men of being murderers. And also I'm so irresistible that both boys want me and now I want to get into the boys. Oh yes, okay, so you were saying boyfriends, plural. I wasn't sure. Cause so, like you were saying it and I'm like, boyfriends, friends, plural? She, she has two cop boyfriends, but she doesn't. Because the entire book they set up, this is the laziest love triangle I've ever seen. And I read a lot of YA. <laughs> She's into, one guy is from the FBI and one guy is like a former cop, but he's still kind of a cop. And apparently they have bad blood. They don't like each other, but no one ever tells you why the entire book. They just don't like each other. And again, maybe the first book, she had more of a relationship with both of them. But there's two guys, there's Caleb and there's Pierce. Pierce is the FBI guy. Caleb is the ex-cop who's also an artsy guy. I think he does the woodworking. So he's at the craft show with her all the time. So she goes on like three different dates with Caleb and he kisses her multiple times in this book. And she goes on about how giddy she is with Caleb. But then Pierce, the other guy, sees them kissing once and she's like, oh no, I hope he's not upset and doesn't think I don't like him too. But the entirety of the book suggests that you don't. You like the other guy because you keep going on dates with the other guy. And the one time Pierce asked you out, you told him you were busy, but you went on three dates with the other guy. So how is this a love triangle? This is, uh, I'm in love with Caleb, but I want to keep Pierce around too, even though I'm not interested. That's not a love triangle. No, that's you having a second, that's you having a plan, a backup plan. Yeah, Pierce is the backup. There is no, like, barely, there's barely any dialogue between them the entire book, except for, oh, I, I think I know who the murderer is, and then Pierce shows up with, you know, the FBI cops or whatever. I know nothing about cops. Um, but there's, like, no interaction between her and this character, and his interaction with the other boyfriend, that's actually her boyfriend, is just he doesn't like him and they're just stoic at each other all the time and at one point she like she takes the the caleb guy that she goes on the dates with to her aunt's restaurant like multiple times and then at the end when she kisses this guy after they've been on like four dates and pierce sees them kissing she's like oh well i should let him know he like i like him too i should go on a date with him but i can't go to my aunt's restaurant because then she'll think i'm cheating on caleb because he's my boyfriend it's like, but is he though? I'm so confused. What is happening with this person's love life? Which one of the cops is really your boyfriend? Because it feels like it's specifically the one that you've been dating and not the one that you have not been dating. Right. And like, also, yeah, the, the weird fantasy-esque of that is just uncomfortable. What, it's what, just uncomfortable. I could, I, what I would assume, like if I were, I'm not going to read the other two, I refuse. But my assumption would be that in the first book, she quote unquote set up that there was two guys and they're both cute cops and she somehow meets both of them solving a case and, you know, learning that she has magic paint powers, which by the way, everyone just buys immediately when she tells them this. She tells the cop, she tells her mother, she tells the psychic, she tells everyone, oh yeah, I have magic paint powers. They're all just like, yeah, tell me more. They don't question it at all. Okay, I could buy it that her mother and the psychic are cool with the magic paint powers. But the two cops? No. Just, oh, by the way, I know who the killer is because I have magic paint powers. Yes, of course we believe you because you're cute and we want to date you. No! No! Yeah. <laughs> so, um... Uh, what was I saying? I, I lost track. 
I lost track of my complaints. Oh. I think you were hoping that the boyfriends were introduced in the first I'm, book. I'm hoping that in the first book they were both introduced and maybe the Pierce character got a little more play of, I like both of them. And maybe this one was Caleb's book to shine. And maybe the third book is where she's into Pierce and she can't make up her mind. But when, like I said, everything in this book, I think she maybe was relying too much on, oh, I set that up in the first book. I'm going to assume that people read the first book which I think is wrong with this kind of book because the whole point of this kind of book is to be able to pick one off the shelf at random and read a cozy little mystery and not have to remember all this stuff. So when the family and the grandma and the psychic and the boyfriends and the best friend and everyone else just gets told, you know, all these characters just get set up as, oh yeah, remember my best friend? She's here for a chapter and you have to rely on them maybe having been introduced in a previous book or the relationship with the other cop boyfriend maybe being introduced in a previous book to get any enjoyment out of these inner relationships between these characters, it falls so flat on its face. So, you know what's great about that? The one book that I read that I read the second one and didn't read the other two yet was Apocalypse Arc. <laughs> and Apocalypse Arc did a damn good job of filling you in on who everybody was. Uh, it's really sad that Apocalypse <laughs> Arc is is beating this book out. Like that's where we're at, folks. And I'm not even kidding. <laughs> that's where we're at, folks. Apocalypse like, Arc is better writing than Murder you know, Can Confuse Your Chihuahua. If this is your trash, fine. Everyone has trash. I watch, you know thousand pound sisters on tlc i like trash i have my trash and if this is your trash that's fine i'm not gonna i'm not gonna yuck anybody's yum if this is what you read if this is what you like <laughs> here's another one for you i guess i just am perplexed <laughs> by how this is a genre and how is it so easy to publish in this genre that something like this gets published jen this is where the money is why aren't we writing this because this apparently is what we it takes should do. no effort mary let's do it uh this is committing to write a bad mystery novel yes and let's do it as badly as we can and the thing is like oh my god i've read novels that i wouldn't call like mystery novels like the the pumpkin man kind of had like that whodunit to it but it was more horror than mystery and the same with the patterson was more of a thriller but in those books, it's building to something, right? You're building to the reveal. You're building to the catch the bad guy. You're actually looking for clues. You're actually, and I like a good mystery. I, I'm I'm a sucker for a good mystery detective show. I've seen way too many seasons of um, Law and Order, way too many. Um, like I like a good procedural. And this was just like, she finds a bunch of clues that lead nowhere. And then she accidents her way into the bad guy and it just, it was so unfulfilling. The plot was unfulfilling. The characters are so flat. There's just nothing likable about this book. I liked none of it. <laughs> none of it? Not even the cute chihuahua? No, because he's annoying. And he's he acts like a real person, but he's not a person. And for some reason, the chihuahua can see the ghost, but no one else can. And also the dog's name is Van Gogh, which is stupid. <laughs> And now you're just being nitpicky. Now you're being nitpicky. And the boyfriend that's actually the boyfriend, not the other boyfriend that's not really a boyfriend, he also has a dog whose name is Gumshoe because that's not on the nose. And like <laughs> Gumshoe and, and Van Gogh are like friends, even like, but not really the way that dogs are friends. Just like, oh, we're going to go visit your dog friend. Just like, we're going to go visit my parents. And then, you know, the dog covers his face with his anthropomorphic paws. And... <laughs> so bad like i didn't oh. like i didn't like any of it i didn't like the dog i didn't like her stupid pink caravan i didn't like the fact that she doesn't actually like okay here's the thing too i've been to craft festivals i have been at banning booths at craft festivals you you make very little money at these things it's very very hard to make a living doing this especially when you spend no time at your booth and when you're selling the same product that everyone else is selling, apparently, and the only thing that differentiates you from them is that you have small hidden messages in your paintings that you don't know how they get there. They just magically appear that like it just it's 
the craft fair and the and the the crafting mystery is just a gimmick to sell these books that it's a craft you know there there are a bunch there's there's a redecorating mystery series there's a pickle shop mystery series there's i'm not even kidding there's a um yard sale mystery series there's a couple i was gonna of, say the antique stores and the yard sale ones i've antique seen those. ones there's a couple of knitting ones there's a couple of like uh, bake shop ones they're all just a gimmick to sell a different series and that's obviously the gimmick there's no substance to her being at the craft fair other than it's the setup it's the gimmick right right it's just uh, it's this entire book is a gimmick that's 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 what it boiled down boils down to this is just she went what's my gimmick my gimmick is dog murder craft fair ghosts and then she published it and this is what this is what sells mm-hmm and I'm sorry. I'm sorry if you're the author and you're listening to me say this. You can leave a comment about how wrong I am. Please do. Explain to me why this is your life's work and why you thought this was a good book. <laughs> Mary's like, I dare you. I dare, I dare you. you. Come at me. Come at me. It was painful. It was a painful read because it, it's just, like I said, maybe it's just not for me. Maybe I'm the wrong audience. I'll give it the benefit of the doubt that I am the wrong audience for this book. But it's just bad. Do you think just shot in the dark here do you think that maybe this book was marketed to the wrong audience no i think it's exactly what it's supposed to be i think that this is a book written for you know there's a review for on the cozy review.com it's got a, like three and four stars i like, know well that's just my thing is it's written for a certain kind of person it's written for people who like these books where you can read them in an afternoon it's a cozy little mystery you get you barely pay attention to it you read it on the beach or on a plane or in an airport or before bed you know it's not supposed to be this makes you think you know really intriguing you can't sleep for days because of how good it was kind of a book it's not made to be that see but this is what kills me why does this stuff exist why don't people want to read and enjoy a book because you want to talk about mysteries that were well done one shot you get it out of the way and it blew your freaking mind we read the grown-up jillian flynn's mm -hmm. grown-up that was a mystery really but it was also you think about that too the grown-up was also kind of disturbing and kind of gross and kind of raunchy it was a little raunchy, but at the same time, like the overall, like the character was pretty, like she wasn't this deep character, not no. really. And it was one shot mystery kind of thing. And it, it got you, it got you going. I just, when I think about the kind of people I know that read these kinds of mystery books, they're people who I don't think really want something heavy. That's the other thing. Some people can't. Some people, when they watch a mystery show or when they watch a, or they read a book, they can't handle like really gruesome murder or like really intense, like intense shit. Like it freaks them out. Like but it even can have... still be a good story. Yeah. I just, I, I wonder if I, I would maybe think about giving another kind of book like this a chance of different author, different book series to see if it's like, a condition of the whole genre or if it's just this one author who i can't even find a website for her so she's probably this might be under a pseudonym or this might just be she doesn't even care enough to have an author page she just cranks these out and puts them through a publisher um and so the usa today best-selling author like who reads usa today um <laughs> who reads usa today <laughs> but like <laughs> I, Mary's just all out <laughs> slamming things. Go read USA Today. I'm <laughs> really, really mad. This book took me three months to read. Okay. <laughs> um, I just like I think it's just a certain. The reason why it's light and it's and it doesn't have substance is because it's meant to be quick and easy. And uh, I read this little book and it entertained me for ten minutes. Like I said, same reason why people watch reality television. Which and I get it because I watch reality television. I do, and it's awful for you. And it's it you shouldn't. And it's crap. And like I said, I, I'm not going to say that I don't watch or enjoy trash. I enjoy a lot of trash and I don't know why I enjoy it. And maybe for some people, this is just a thing to turn your brain off for a little bit and not have to think about the plot and not have to try to solve the mystery and not have to care about the characters. Because like, I'm the kind of person who, when I read a book, I get really, really invested in the characters. 
characters are my favorite part of a story book tv movie whatever and it actually it's it's triggering and upsetting almost when you read a really good book and it doesn't end well for the characters you like or you watch a show and they kind of blow off the characters that you like and they don't get a like a good ending like that can actually be like emotionally hard for me sometimes like I'm sure you've been through that oh yes oh yes like you become emotionally invested in characters so maybe the point of having this one dimensional oh look I solved the mystery by tripping over it character with no with no ambition and with a bunch of side characters that are cardboard cutouts is that you don't get invested in them so it's easy to put one of these down and pick another one up and you just fly through them and it's just easy reading. It's just like watching a crappy TV show on the back in the background of whatever you're doing. It's easy to consume. Yeah, okay. But like, that's like fast food for books. It is. That's exactly what this is. 100% this is fast food for books. Well, then this gives me a tummy ache, just like fast food. <laughs> but this isn't even like good fast food. This is like Taco Bell. <laughs> well, it does have a chihuahua on it. Yo quiero. Oh, we. <laughs> That's awesome. <clears throat> so, so, oh, 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 the last, the last thing, the last thing. And then I will stop trashing this book. <laughs> well, I, you had, know. I had to say this, okay? I want you, Jen. There are, let me see. Hold on. There are. Let's play a game, shall we? Let's see if, oh, if, no. my, if my theory pans out. This book has, I think, like 200 and some pages, 287 pages. Um, a couple of the pages at the back are like filler acknowledgements bullshit. Um, so I want you to pick a number between like one and 300, let's say. That's big number, Mary. Let's pick a number. All right, well, let's page 99 the book. Page 99, okay. I don't, is that a, a, something I should know what that means? Yes, in... It's like a thing. You don't read the beginning or the end of a book if you want to get the juice of what it's all about. You read the page 99. Okay, then I'll read you page 99. How about that? Okay. I'll read you the whole damn thing. Also, um, I should <laughs> I should say that um, this is an ebook, so the pages aren't like full pages. They're like little ebook pages. Okay. So this is maybe half a page. Okay. It's like a paragraph. Let's see if my theory pans out. I'll read it from the previous page because it's the middle of a sentence. So I'll read the, the sentence that starts from the previous page. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. How would I know for sure if Danny, Danny's shoe size, Danny's the old man she keeps harassing. How would I know for sure Danny's shoe size? It wasn't like I could come right out and ask him. Having this detail was better than nothing though. And I could rule out Danny if the shoe size didn't fit. We should change the subject. Caleb took a bite of his burger. Caleb insisted on discussing other things as we finished dinner and topped it off with a large servings of Aunt Patty's chocolate cherry cake. After finishing our food, we paid Aunt Patty and headed outside. She would she would never want to accept money from Caleb, but she had a problem taking it, but she had no problem taking it from me. I would have insisted she take the money anyways. Everyone in my family tried to pay for each other's stuff. It was an ongoing battle. Aunt Patty thought Caleb was a cutie. Darkness had settled around us as we'd, as we'd enjoyed dinner. I couldn't help but be a bit nervous about this. After all, there was a killer out there somewhere. That's the end of the chapter. And then it gives you a, a recipe for Aunt Patty's chocolate cake. I was going to guess. I was like, I bet you we get the recipe chapter. So you'll notice that she asks herself random questions. Yes. She does this on like every other page. The way that she tries to solve her mystery is by asking herself arbitrary questions that make no sense, like that don't mean anything. She just asks herself questions. And so like she didn't ask Caleb about the No, shoe she thing. asked herself these questions. She asked him one question. She asked him um no, she didn't ask him anything. She just asked herself these questions. How would I know for sure the shoe size? But then she says Caleb wanted to talk about something else. Yeah, because they were talking about something else earlier in the chapter. That's such a confusing s paragraph. What is happening? Yeah, she just randomly asks herself random questions. And also, she uses the words, thank goodness, constantly. Is that her? Oh, what, what's the one in? It's her like, oh my. Yes, it's her oh my. 
<laughs> she uses this this phrase constantly. I, I screenshot it if you let me see. Um, see if I can find a good one. Because she says it like at least once a chapter, she says, thank goodness. And at least once every two pages, she asks herself questions. Oh my um, goodness. Why was he doing this? How would I save myself? Like, it's just constant. It's just constant. And I just, it baffles me. It really baffles me how this got published. <laughs> <laughs> I I love how, like, we look at this and wonder, how the heck does it get published? And and it flies. These are the ones that fly off the shelves. I know. They do. <laughs> They fly off the shelves to the point where we are throwing them away because they're literally losing pages. Mm -hmm. Like you, and yet people are like, give me another one. Give me another one. And it is, it's just, it's okay. Just trash. It's just I totally may trash. be forced to read one just to see if it is like the genre. Or if it's just this author. Or if it's just this author. Um, okay. I'm going to read you the rest of this podcast is just going to be me reading excerpts from this book that I enjoyed. <laughs> so this is her. Isn't there like a copyright thing about that? Do we have to be careful? Um, uh, yes and no. <laughs> We're reading it. You're critiquing it. So technically that's fair use. Got it. And, and also, also we're using less than like, I think it's like less than 10% of the work that you're critiquing or whatever you can use. I'm not going to read the whole book. Obviously I'm reading excerpts so that I can prove a point. Um, <laughs> So this is the, this is after the second time she's gone on a date with the boyfriend, but that's not her boyfriend, but that's her boyfriend. She says, um, he says something to her. I don't, I didn't screenshot what he said to her. It was something like, oh, I, I don't know. I had a nice time or whatever. Right. Or I, I, I don't know, something romancy. As soon as the word left his lips, my whole body tingled. I'd never heard him mention anything about romance. I didn't, oh, he said something was romantic. That's what it was. He said, oh, this is, this was romantic. <clears throat> I didn't know what to think about the comment, but I couldn't help feeling giddy inside. Was he feeling the same way? Was that why he had mentioned the romantic setting? That had to be the reason. Why else would he make such a comment? Question, question, question. He was right though. It was romantic. <laughs> well, if it was, if I ignored the fact that there was a, that a murderer could walk, be walking nearby. <laughs> So does she end every chapter with like, there could be a murderer? A lot of times, yes. That's not the end of the chapter. That was like mid page. And then later in the same, in the same interaction, um, they talk about she, it's the end of the night. She wants to go to her trailer. Um, Caleb stood in front of me. Our eyes met. He moved close. Oh, a nervous feeling settled in my stomach again. He moved closer and I knew what would happen next. He leaned down and kissed me. His lips felt soft as they moved across mine. As we kissed, I had my eyes closed. Though almost immediately, I sensed something and opened them. From over Caleb's shoulder, movement caught my attention. Pierce stood at the side of my trailer. He definitely seen me kissing Caleb. Okay, what junior high girl wrote that scene? Right, right. And then, and then... Okay, okay, I have to read the rest of this because this is her, this is her, this is the one little bit we get of them of a hint that she even likes the other guy. Caleb realized something was wrong and he moved his lips away from mine. He checked over his shoulder and saw Pierce too. Without saying a word, Pierce walked away. I wasn't more sure what to say What to say either. Part of me wanted to run after him and tell him that I didn't know what my feelings were for Caleb. But another part of me didn't want to hurt Caleb's feelings either because I liked him. You're not sure what your feelings are, but you like him. And you've been on three dates with him, but not the other guy, but you don't know what, what you don't want the other guy to think that you like Caleb better because you're dating Caleb but not him. <sighs> this dating thing was tough and I didn't know how it worked. Okay, well, here's where I ask, how old is this character supposed to be? In her 30s, I think. What 30-year-old woman can't figure out her feelings? I don't know. I mean, I would say late twenties, early thirties is the age of this character because I think like she says something about like she left her other career to try to be an artist full time or something. And she's got two cop boyfriends. How long does it take you to become a cop? I mean, and she's got younger brothers who aren't seem like they're maybe like early twenties. Like she doesn't give like an, a definite age of how old she is, but I would say my age at the youngest, right? Right. But I didn't know how dating worked. Like, 
And then she says, okay, this dating thing was tough and I didn't know how it worked. Both guys were nice and I wasn't sure who I wanted to date. That's funny because you're only dating one of them. Oh my gosh. Like, does she, does she know what dating is? You've gone out with the one guy three times and you blew the other guy off. I'm pretty sure you know which one you're dating. And then she says, um, um, both guys were nice. But I wasn't sure I wanted to date. I suppose it would work itself out as I spent more time with the men. I'd spent the most time with Caleb. No shit. <laughs> oh, like, like, how do you not know that you're dating somebody? <laughs> because she's clearly actually 12, maybe Apparently. 15. Maybe that's why she's so bad at mysteries and likes her dog too much. This was this was really written by a 15-year-old, wasn't it? Don't lie. Maybe. You know what? Here, I will add this caveat. If this was a book written and published by a 15-year-old, I applaud you. You are very accomplished. Good for you getting a book published at 15. A trilogy, for that matter, published at 15. Yes! Well, you've got a long way to go, but, you know, it's a start. If that is the case, if Rose Pressy, which sounds like a 15-year-old's name, maybe is indeed a high schooler this is pretty damn good and also if aunt janet is willing to put a, <laughs> a quote on the front aunt janet helped you out <laughs> oh my god are there oh my god oh my god it's the same quote on both books aunt janet help you out <laughs> it's the same rose pressy's books are fun on both books Okay. When I was in high school, I was in theater. I was a theater kid. Can you tell? No. <laughs> and my theater teacher had this thing where she would say if something was cute, it meant it was bad, but she didn't want to hurt anybody's feelings. That is what books are fun means. Yes. Yes. Especially when it's on two different books. And it's the only quote they've got. Uh, I'm kind of interested to see. Oh, this is going to be such a long ass episode. Um, <laughs> I'll cut out some of it, but it's a lot of good ranting time. Oh, we're over an hour. We should probably wrap this up pretty soon. <laughs> I'm interested to see like a Goodreads review of this. Like to see how people who actually read these books and enjoy these books, what they would say about this book. Maybe that'll kind of clear up some mysteries for us <laughs> we'll just stumble into that i spell chihuahua hua hua h-u-a h-u-a there we go thank you <laughs> please leave that in there <laughs> okay goodreads let's see let's see like it has like a four-star rating on goodreads that's what i don't understand we're not it for this mary no, we are not we're it. not let's let's look for a good rating like a five-star rating there it is, uh, first one. This is not a rating. This is just a summary of the book. This is the summary of the book. Is this the author? No, Natalia R. No. A fun and lighthearted paranormal cozy. This this is weird. The end of this review says the one that you just started reading. Thank you to Net Galley and King kingston books for the opportunity to read this arc and exchange advanced readers copy in exchange for an honest review that doesn't sound like an honest review no i found celeste to be a likable main character however i like to see her be more responsible in her sleuthing no shit i enjoyed her interaction with her family i'm very intrigued by her father's ability to sense ghosts i don't remember that ama or ama or i don't know how to pronounce it is the ghost it was an enjoyable character i was sad to see her go I know many readers just like the trope, but I personally love a good love triangle. It wasn't a good love triangle. It's the worst love triangle. It's the <laughs> worst one. I think it's pretty obvious who she's going to choose because she already picked one. Yes. <laughs> like I said, unless unless the next book has more of the other guy in it, but like this is the this is worse than Edward versus Jacob. This is worse than Phantom and Raul because at least in those books. There's actually an idea that she might go for both guys instead of this would be like if in Twilight she spent all four books just hanging out with Edward and going, oh, look, there's Jacob and waving at him from a distance. 
<laughs> I enjoyed this unusual cozy mystery. At times, the pacing is slow. However, the protagonist's paranormal paintings capture my attention. Um, here's a three star. I truly enjoyed the first book. Unfortunately, I can't say the same thing for the second. Uh, it didn't have the same ingredients to hold my attention. The main character seems to be less intelligent and far too careless. <laughs> Premise is similar to the first. I'm, 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 we're, we're uh, scanning these reviews. I'm not reading the whole thing. Oh, come on, Miss Pressy. I know you're a far better writer than this book proves. I've read your other material and enjoyed it. Maybe I got the bad book. There was an excellent start to the series and I hope it would grow with the second book, but instead it reads as if it's the first attempt by someone who has no idea what the story is about. That's exactly what it is. Oh, that makes me wonder if the first book is better, but I don't want to find out. I don't <laughs> Just read the page 99. Just page 99, page 99. Mary. I mean, maybe, maybe the first book was good and- <laughs> uh, This one's writing was a little confusing. Didn't okay, really understand maybe- the main character. <laughs> Maybe the reason why this book has such good reviews is because all these women are way too nice. This is a four-star review that says the writing was confusing and I don't understand the character. Why did you give it a four-star review? Because it's a fun story! Exclamation point! Uh, why would you give it a four-star review for that? Um, Two-star. Fast, easy read, but what a mess. Celeste is <gasps> supposed to be working at a craft fair. She's rarely there because she's sleuthing. The mystery just kind of gets wrapped up by accident. True story. There's a bunch of ghosts thrown in and then her quirkly family. And that's not enough. If that's not enough cozy tropes, let's throw in some random recipes. Too much going on without anything really happening. That's an Maria, honor for you. We like you, Maria. <laughs> yes. We need to set up a, oh, we have a Goodreads account. We haven't put any reviews on it yet. Um, mostly because you see how long it takes me to review a book. I just uh, ranted we- for an hour. Okay, Mary, you and I are going to sit down and we're just going to review all the books that we've done on Goodreads. That's what's going to happen. We do have an account on Goodreads. You can find us on Goodreads. We will eventually review all the books there. So you can, you know, see in in a snapshot what our our opinions are. Um, Or we could just link to the episode. I don't know if we can do that. Maybe. Um, I don't feel like you put personal (laughs) links in like reviews like this. Um, Here's another two-star review. I'm being mean, I'm just reading the two star reviews. Um, some things are consistent between the first and second. Celeste is still going to a cr- camping craft shows with her pink pickup. Um, she, yet she travels back to her hometown not only to have dinner. Oh, this one is in Cherokee, North Carolina, which is about an hour away from Gatlinburg, her home. Yet she travels to her hometown to have dinner with her aunt, or to have dinner at her aunt's diner and to visit the town of Psychic and to visit her parents, like, every single day. So she's driving an hour away from where she's working to visit these people? I I didn't pay attention to where this takes place. The ghost or two, the best friend, Sammy, and, of course, the stumbled upon murder. Yes. It's cliche. It just takes all the cliche. A lot of these four-star reviews are just summaries of the book, which makes me wonder if they are... Page advanced reader comments. copies all these four stars that are just summaries of the book say that they had advanced readers copies yes so i wonder if they gave it for oh my god now we're now we're really we're really assuming things but i wonder if some of these they got advanced reader copies so they kind of were nice that is not why you get an advanced reading copy you get an advanced reading copy because you've got to get honest reviews and that's the only time the author has a chance to save it yeah Oh, Caleb, the undercover FBI agent. I got them wrong. Pierce, I thought Pierce was the FBI, but maybe I, I guess I'm wrong. Undercover, I didn't get, I didn't know that. I, apparently I didn't pay that much attention to some of this stuff. Police, Caleb, and also police, Pierce, the police detective, are now working for the FBI. Um, still a love triangle. I really do not like these, so I hope the author can get this resolved in the next book. <laughs> this is also just a summary of the book. Um, it's, Celeste is quite the character. She's smart and tenacious. But she also has some paranormal abilities. Is this also advanced readers one? Oh my gosh. I don't know. So the books the book has mixed reviews. Even the ones that give it like four stars have things that aren't very nice to say about it. It's like here's four stars, but here's what I really think. Yeah. So I don't know. And there's a lot of two star reviews on here too. And again, maybe these are people a lot of people like the first one better than the second one. Maybe I should have read the first one. Um 
Ooh, one star review. Nothing is deep or exciting in this one. The main character does things so obviously stupid it make me unable to get into the story. It made me unable to get the story. Not one for my shelf. Oh, next got Kelly advanced did reader's copy. Yes. So I don't know. That that was kind of a fun thing. Maybe we should do that when we get when we get books that we don't like or that we don't understand why people like them. We should look at Goodreads and see what the consensus is. It does seem like the people who are giving it higher stars that didn't get advanced readers copies um, are kind of just into the kind of, you know, fluffy aspect of it, right? Yeah, and the reviews aren't really reviews. They're just sort of talking about, like, the plot of the book. Not what they liked or... These people did not get good grades in school when it came to doing a book report. You know, it also is a little telling that not all of the reviews, but most of the reviews on here are people who say that they got advanced readers copies. Yeah. Okay, my cats are desperately trying to get in my room right now. Yeah, it's, it's probably my dinner time. So it's probably time to wrap up. I don't, I can't, <laughs> I need to stop screen sharing. There we go. <laughs> it's been a while. I forgot to do everything. <laughs> So that was my very, very not at all biased opinion of this book. Hey, that is why we do this. This was the the my least favorite thing that we have read. Really? Your least favorite? Yeah, least favorite thing that I have read. Okay. Yeah. Because I have read some winners. Yeah. But I, hey, the next couple that I'm gonna talk about, I actually like. Hopefully the next time I read and review a book, it'll be something I like. So in the next four months, we'll see what I've read and uh, maybe we'll, we'll get a good review out of me. And we need more books from our friends. Which friends? Like our writer friends. Yeah, Please. but then see my, I, I feel like sometimes what happens is we read books from our friends that we actually genuinely like and we review them and then we read bad books on purpose. And then it just seems like we only are nice to the books written by our friends. No, because I loved Apocalypse Arc. That's true. You did like that. And I love I love Tot and Badger. I want to read another one of those. See, we like bad books that are good bad books. Does that yes. Make sense? Yes. Apocalypse Arc was awful. It was a grindhouse bad sci-fi. But it was fantastic to read. Because it was more it, trash. And it owned it. It owned what it was. And that is why Hot and Badgered was good too. It owned what it was. Yeah, this book was barely trying to. I think this book was just a cash grab, frankly. Ugh. All right, I'm done. I'm done complaining about it. Do we have anything else to say before we go today, Jen? I'm really glad that my new equipment works well. <laughs> yes, works very well. <laughs> oh, but that's about it. I am excited. I am glad that we got through this book finally because Mary finally reviewed a book this I year. Know, it's the first book I've done this year, and we are in mid March. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's okay. I got plenty more. I'll carry the weight. I, know. I got Jen, it. You know, Jen does the reading. I do the editing. It it all evens out. It's it's balance, Mary. It's all yeah. about balance. Balance in the force. Balance in the force. All right. Well, then, until next time, uh, we will say goodbye to you. Bye. Kind of heard you. <laughs> Thank you so much for cracking another case with Mary and Jen. To learn more about Casing the Cover, follow us on Facebook and Twitter at Casing the Cover. To contact us or suggest a book, email casingthecoverpod at gmail.com. New episodes of Casing the Cover release the second and fourth Tuesday on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Stitcher. <laughs>